men and women of UAW Region 2B and Jeep are proud partners in our heritage of building American vehicles right here at home for our region, for our community, and for the world. This production, Jeep Steel Soldier, tells the story of the vehicle that helped to win the war and the incredible men and women that made it possible. That spirit of teamwork and cooperation is still evident in our people and the work they do to build on and strengthen this legacy. Jeep and UAW Region 2B are proud to support Jeep Steel Soldier. Support also provided by the Ohio Humanities Council with a We the People grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. In the summer of 1940, as America was being drawn into the Second World War, three car companies competed to win a government contract to develop and build a small reconnaissance vehicle for the U.S. Army, what we know today as the first Jeep. You can't really say that any one person or entity invented the Jeep. There were multiple fathers involved. The DNA came from various different sources. Although it was created to win World War II, the battle to build the Jeep had its own winners and losers. The resulting vehicle was nothing short of extraordinary. It captured the hearts and imaginations of a nation and earned the loyalty and respect of the men and women it served. The Jeep was the unlikeliest of heroes, a small yet tenacious vehicle that trudged, forded, climbed, leapt, and fought its way through every theater of war. At a crucial point in history, and in every war-torn corner of the world, the Jeep not only answered the call to fight, but seemed to embody the spirit of freedom. World War I ushered in the modern age of warfare. Trucks and automobiles began replacing horses and wagons. The vehicles were put to the test on the muddy roads and battlefields of Europe, where the merits of four-wheel drive were quickly apparent. If it didn't have four-wheel drive, it was very often stuck. So the French and the British were buying American four-wheel drives to use on the battlefield there because they couldn't produce the number of trucks that they actually needed. So there were a lot of American FWDs and Nash quads uh, serving with foreign militaries in World War I. The use of four-wheel drive pretty much followed large trucks though. They didn't have any light four-wheel drives at that time. They wanted a very small, very light uh, utility vehicle that could be used in the battlefield that would kind of replace the motorcycle and be a little more user-friendly. And they tried taking various civilian cars and stripping every superfluous uh, piece of equipment off of them, putting the biggest tires that they could find at the time on them trying to get them to be adequate uh, off-road performers, and they had only moderate success at that. After World War I, the budgets were, for the military were drastically cut, and so any development of a light four-wheel drive was pretty much put on the back burner from 1918 to about the late 1930s. The time when we knew that there was a war coming and that we better get ourselves ready for it. On June 19, 1940, with the Nazis marching through France, the Army Quartermaster Corps sent representatives to the American Bantam Car Company in Butler, Pennsylvania to discuss the design of a four-wheel drive reconnaissance car. Bantam built small four-cylinder cars at a time when big and powerful models ruled the showrooms. The company had tried selling their cars to the Army unsuccessfully for years and was on the verge of bankruptcy. The Army left Butler with a vision for what they wanted. Bantam, thinking they'd been rescued by a government contract, went to work developing a four-wheel drive car. Now Bantam probably thought they had a lock on it because they'd spent a lot of time working with the Army, fleshing out the idea. But what Bantam didn't know was that the government was sharing that information with other car companies and looking for other manufacturers. The Quartermaster Corps sent invitations to 135 other car companies requesting initial bids, blueprints, and a parts list in just 11 days. The winning bidder would then have to complete a working prototype in 49 days. If the pilot car passed the Army's tests, the winner would receive a contract for another 70 vehicles. Bantam called Carl Probst a freelance designer with a reputation for working quickly. 
On his way from Detroit to Butler, Pennsylvania, Probst stopped in Toledo to speak with engineers at Spicer about axles and a transfer case for the new vehicle. The Spicer factory was less than a mile from another contender for the same contract, Willie's Overland. After arriving in Butler and meeting with the Bantam team, Probst went to work. Using the specs provided by the Army and information compiled by the Bantam engineers, he completed the design plans in just three days. Carl Probst was probably the, the guy who took the Jeep's first portrait, and he was the first person to put it down on paper. Bantam and Willys Overland were the only bidders on the initial contract. Although the Willys bid was lower, they couldn't meet the Army's 49-day deadline, and Bantam was awarded the contract to build their pilot car. The question now was, could they do it? They had a decent-sized facility, but they had almost nobody working there. There's some reports that they had only 15 people working at the factory at the time that they got the Jeep contract. What Bantam lacked in employees, it made up in skill and dedication. Plant manager Harold Christ was a talented engineer and an ex-race car driver who had worked at Duesenberg. Christ, along with engineers Ralph Turner and Chester Hempfling, built the pilot vehicle by hand. To meet the Army's specifications, they installed a 40-horsepower four-cylinder engine from the Continental Motor Car Company. Using all the available parts they could get from the production line, they come up with a finished vehicle. Everybody said they'd, they'd never make it, they'd never make it, but they did. They finished the car one day early. The Bantam crew posed for a picture outside the Butler factory before Probst and Chris drove the 230 miles to Camp Hollabird, Maryland and delivered the vehicle with 30 minutes to spare. The Army took over. They knew that this vehicle was, had been developed in a very short time, and they didn't, frankly, expect a whole lot from it, and it delivered way more than they expected. There was nothing like it in the Army inventory at the time, and it held up very well to their serialized abuse. One of the Army uh, test officers said it was the best vehicle he ever tested in, in his years in the Army. Uh, it, it, they just couldn't, they couldn't break it. Once that vehicle passed the Army's tests, the project was approved and the contract was enacted and Bantam went on to build the Mark II or the BRC-60 models. And then suddenly Bantam found out that they were in a three-way race for a contract. Despite their success at Camp Hollibird, some government officials questioned Bantam's ability to fill a large military contract, and they encouraged Willys and Ford to develop prototypes. Willys Overland and Ford were frequently seen at Camp Hollibird observing the tests and making notes of various different technical features of the vehicle. They agreed to take a government contract to develop a vehicle, so the vehicle belonged to the government. They could look at any part of the car they want. They could look at the blueprints. They could do anything. The government wanted Ford involved because their production capacity and their development capacity. They had a lot of factories and a lot of people. Where Bantam and, and uh, Willys both had one factory and Willys had 5,000 employees. Bantam only had 15 employees. Willys Overland, much like American Bantam, needed a government contract. Before the Great Depression, they were one of the top five car companies in America. They were really being marginalized in the automobile industry. The, the effects of the depression was pushing these smaller companies almost to the wall. They used their own funds to develop a prototype called the Quad, which they presented for testing on November 13, 1940. The Quad and the Bantam may have shared similar styling, but under the hood it was all Willys Overland. The Quad was powered by their 60 horsepower Go Devil engine developed by Chief Engineer Barney Roos. 60 horsepower, you think about today, that's kind of small, you know, but if you bought a brand new 1940 Ford automobile, you had a choice of two V8s. The standard V8 was 70 horsepower, the deluxe V8 was 85 horsepower. So here you got half the engine with almost the same horsepower. Using the Go Devil was risky because the bigger engine put the quad over the prescribed weight limit. But Barney Roos believed the weight specs would change and the added horsepower would pay off. But the Army initially rejected the quad because of its weight, and it looked like Willys would not be permitted to bid on the contract. As that rejection moved up the, the Army food chain, it was decided to overrule 
that weight penalty that they've been given early on. Had that initial rejection stayed in place, Willie Zoverlin and Toledo, Ohio might not have been a player in the, in the Jeep story. The Ford Motor Company entered the race with a prototype they called the Pygmy. Its innovative design helped make it the early favorite to win the contract. They incorporated some design features that later became visual hallmarks for the Jeep. The flat hood, the little T-handles that um, the Jeeps are known for, the, the hood hold downs, those were invented by Ford. Uh, Ford also mounted the headlights actually behind the grill and underneath the hood, so they were in a protected area. Both the Willys and the Phantom headlights were out and much more exposed and more vulnerable. And Ford, by simply tucking them behind the grill and underneath the hood, protected them, but also helped to create that distinctive look that we think of now as the Jeep. They had no good four-cylinder engine. They used a tractor engine. It's the only four-cylinder they had. If Ford would have had a good engine, I'm sure they would have won the contract hands down because the government was buying trucks from them and they liked dealing with them. All three companies received orders for 1,500 improved versions of their vehicles. There were three significant designs. It was the Bantam BRC40, uh, called the Bantam Reconnaissance Car. Fords were called GP, which was not general purpose. That was their code, factory code for G was government, P was 80 inch wheelbase platform. Then there was the Willys MA, which was the development of the quad. The new models all met the Army's increased weight limit of 2,160 pounds, although just barely. Barney Roos had uh, engineers take our quad apart. They shortened the bolts wherever they could and, and, uh, and lightened the uh, steel wherever they could. And they got in within a couple of ounces under the weight. But if they painted it too heavy, it would be overweight. The Army's extensive testing revealed the strengths and weaknesses of each vehicle and helped determine what would be incorporated into the final design of the Jeep. All three of those were approved for use by the military and it came down to then who put in the lowest bid. American Bantam developed the first vehicle, completed every challenge, met every deadline, but didn't win the government contract. Willys Overland submitted the lowest bid. Barney Roos compiled all of the Army's requirements into the design of the Willys MB, and they began to roll off the production lines in Toledo. But the Army's orders soon outpaced Willys' capacity. The Army wanted two suppliers, so they asked Ford, essentially, to build the Willys design. Willys then turned over its drawings and specifications to Ford. An unusual thing at the time, although as the war went on, it became far more common, and then Ford made some detail modifications, but basically the parts of a Ford-built Jeep and the parts of a Willys-built Jeep were interchangeable. One of those detail modifications led to the replacement of the slat steel grille on both the Ford and Willys Jeeps and the creation of an indelible American icon. Ford got the idea of making a stamped sheet metal grille, which was much better because one trip of the press, you had the whole grill done, and it also stabilized the front end of the Jeep much better. You know, the thing that everybody knows instantly as Jeep was developed as a production expedient, and nothing more than that. It looked as if the Army and I might somehow get along, because they gave me a nickname. From the words general purpose, they took the G and the P. They called me Jeep. Hmm. It sounded more like a noise than a name. The origin of the name Jeep is actually a matter of some debate. It was used during World War I as a term to describe equipment or recruits that were untested, and several military vehicles have shared the nickname Jeep. Then, in 1935, Eugene the Jeep, a remarkable creature who could do anything, debuted in the Popeye comic strips and was an immediate hit. The GIs are thinking new and unproven. Civilians are thinking Eugene the Jeep, and in reality, both concepts fit. Whatever the true source of the name, credit for publicizing it goes to Willie's Overland test driver, Irving Red Houseman. He referred to the car as a Jeep while driving congressmen and reporters around Washington, D.C. in the Willie's Quad. The name found its way into the papers and newsreels, 
and the rest is history. With the start of World War II, American industries converted their vast production capacity to the war effort. But Jeeps weren't the only war materials rolling off American production lines. Bantam was, was kind of relieved of their duties with regards to the Jeep, but they were given contracts for other war uh, materials, including the ubiquitous Jeep quarter ton trailer and, and other things for the war effort. So they weren't exactly left out of the war, but they were, they were left out of the Jeep business. Ford's war production, once it got rolling, was really very wide and varied. They made, in addition to Jeeps, there was an amphibious version of the Jeep. They made an engine for tanks. They made parts for tanks. The most famous Ford weapon uh, was, of course, the, the B-24 bombers that they assembled out at the Willow Run plant. Willie's Toledo factory was also transformed into a veritable armory as men and women went to work. We built part of the Corsair airplane gull wing section. We built the landing gear for half of the Hellcat, Navy Hellcat fighter planes ever built. Artillery projectiles, we built close to five million of them there. The JB-2 row bomb, which is the same as the uh, German V-1 rocket. All those things were made there during the war. A whole lot of women work in the plant. A lot of them in aircraft and then a lot of them in munitions. I really didn't realize that we were into munitions. That was QT stuff, that, we never knew about that. I first started in aircraft and I, uh, they train you a very, a very short training period and I wanted to be a riveter. That was the thing that was shown in the movies, to be a riveter, but I didn't pass the riveting test so I had to do filing and uh, as soon as I saw the opening for road testing Jeeps, I put my application in there and got transferred and so I started driving Jeeps the next day. I think there were probably close to 50 of us. More women than men, but there were still older men and, and one of the fellows had been, uh, came and drive Jeeps had been in Guadalcanal and he was injured pretty seriously and so he got a job driving Jeeps. So they'd bring the Jeeps right off the line and we'd take every one of them out five miles into West Toledo. Every Jeep, every single one. We drove in the heat, we drove in all kinds of weather. Rain, shine, or whatever, just like the postman do. And we were furnished navy pea coats, helmet, and goggles, and wool gloves. So we were pretty well protected. We didn't do any rough work, we just did road testing. Government inspectors would take it over, do the rough work, the over mounds and rocks and valleys and gullies and all that kind of stuff. We did about 16 or 18 a day. And if they were okay, then they took them on up the, either to the roof or, or to packing them up to send them on, on the train. We didn't want to send one out that was defective. We wanted them in good, uh, good shape or good order so that they, they didn't have any problems after we got them out there. Once they were shipped overseas, it didn't take long for the Jeep to make an impression. It's hard to imagine anybody leaving the United States Army after World War II and not having a, a fond uh, memory of one sort or another about the Jeep. I had a Jeep assigned to me in basic training in South Carolina and uh, saw airplanes named with wives and girlfriends, and I thought, oh, that's a good, good idea. So I got the people in the motor pool to put my wife's name on the Jeep. I think it cost me a little money, but I thought it was worth it. Then used it uh, in England uh, and then crossed the channel with it into France and used that Jeep all the way through the Battle of Bulge and crossing the Rhine, and uh, it always started. That was very comforting because many times your life depended on it and lives of others depended on it starting right away, and it did. Uh, put that thing in four-wheel drive and you don't care whether you're on the road or where you are. You can go right up the hill, through the woods, tear out the bushes, wherever you have to go, and the Jeep will just do it. It was a hard-riding vehicle. 
two canvas seats in the front, two canvas seats in the back. They were extremely hard. And particularly if you rode in convoy for a few hours, you became numb in that area of your body. They'd go through the snow, they'd go through the mud, and uh, if they did get stuck, uh, four or five soldiers could uh, grab a hold of it and push it out, and get it out of the mud, and away they would go. As a frontline ambulance, the rugged mobility of the Jeep saved countless lives on the battlefield. The Jeep would be driven in and wounded would be brought back out that otherwise would have laid there or otherwise might have died. The Jeep had a rack on it and it would carry three litters. And depending on the terrain, we used big lashes and straps to hold the guy on the Jeep because you were gonna go down through the woods. And, you know, it wasn't very comfortable for, for the guy, but it was about the best way we could do it. Instead of being designed for specific purposes, purposes were designed uh, around what the Jeep could do. Priests used them the same mass on and uh, they found they could take uh, deuce and a half truck wheels and uh, fix them so they could mount them on a Jeep and they could put them on a railroad track, hauling boxcars on railroad tracks. They used them for anything you can imagine. You name it, they did it. The Jeep did everything asked of it and more and was embraced by soldiers and the folks at home. The government even capitalized on its popularity to sell a war bond or two. Willie's Overland took great pride in the Jeep's wartime performance, and from Bantam's point of view, too much credit for its creation. Willis Overland applied for the copyright to the Jeep name in 1943, and they were immediately challenged by American Bantam, who said, we built the first Jeep. And the government didn't settle the copyright issue until 1950 when they allowed Willis Overland, because they were the only one left making a Jeep type vehicle, to have that name, but they said you cannot claim that you're the birthplace of the Jeep, because it really was a compilation of many people over many years. The Willie's Jeep is the new contribution to society, truly a boon to all mankind, mighty in war, mightier in peace. When the war finally ended and America returned to civilian life, Ford went back to making cars, but Willie's Overland positioned itself to appeal to their most satisfied customers. Who are you writing to now, Joe? I'm writing a letter to Willis Overland. You know, Ed, I'm mighty fond of this little buggy, and so are lots of other guys in this man's army. When I get back to the farm, I'm gonna have one of them. Whoever there's pulling or pushing to do, this is the baby can do it. Well, in 1944, Jeep started working on uh, a civilian design. They knew they had a, a hit on their hands and that they were going to need post-war vehicles, and they knew that the Jeep was going to have to play a part in it. The civilian Jeep was called the CJ for a civilian Jeep. What they considered the vital task for a civilian Jeep was in agricultural use. So they spent a lot of time adapting the Jeep for agricultural purposes. Willie's first experimental models were modified military jeeps called CJ-1s. The CJ-2s, or agri-jeeps, followed quickly and featured a better transmission with lower gearing for farm use. They were also equipped with a power takeoff to run shaft or belt-driven tools. From that, a CJ-2 was developed a CJ-2A, which was the first production civilian jeep that was initially sold starting in 1945. What they intended was a vehicle that could do everything. The new Jeep is the first successful four-purpose vehicle in automotive history. It is a light truck capable of carrying a substantial load and able to take that load quickly wherever it is needed without regard to road conditions or even lack of roads. It performs as a tractor, bringing to the farm the world-famous Jeep pulling power. It's a portable power plant fully equipped to run farm implements or industrial machines to which power must be carried by belt or shaft. And it can take that power to the job over the roughest terrain. It's a passenger conveyance, not a limousine of course, but a dependable carry-all that gives reasonable riding comfort over good roads and can go over bad roads and cross country where no passenger automobile would dare to venture. There has never been any wheeled vehicle in history that offered the amazingly versatile performance of this new concept of power and mobility. We've seen the Jeeps during World War II, how 
versatile they were and how they really could go through the mud and the snow. And so we went ahead and bought a, uh, the 1946 CJ2A. The 2A we used on the farm, we uh, pulled a hay baler with it. We also rotary hold corn. We uh, raked hay. We run errands to town with it. And uh, in fact, uh, during my last uh, year in high school, I, uh, I even drove it to high school. We had uh, a belt pulley that also went on the back so that we could run a buzz saw. They had enough power that they could run a thrashing machine. And besides that, it was more fun to drive than a tractor. Willie's advertised the capability of their Agri Jeeps, but its wartime performance remained their best selling point. To him, its familiar appearance is a badge of merit, identifying a stout comrade that stood beside him through desperate, dangerous days and now waits to serve him even more willingly and faithfully. America embraced the returning hero and the Jeep found a role in agriculture, industry, and at home. The civilian Jeep thrived in the post-war prosperity it helped create. Bantam faded in the 50s, and eventually so did the name Willie's Overland. But the Jeep legend, the original sports utility vehicle, has endured. The Ridge Runners are on the prowl. At Yakima, Washington, the unique outfit of modern-day Rough Riders heeds the call of spring and takes to the hills. They run the ridges and ford the streams, and if the fish are biting after this, it'll be a miracle. But it's Jeep year, and the fish can wait. Ridge runners take a trout stream in stride and head for the tall timber, which is rough on life and limb. Woe betide the poor bloke who stuck like a pig in a poke in a wallow. What the others do to him is hard to swallow. But they're all brothers under the skin. Mud slinging in an election year is quite the vogue. So is kissing babies. Combine the two and cheapers creepers. The men and women of UAW Region 2B and Jeep are proud partners in our heritage of building American vehicles right here at home for our region, for our community, and for the world. This production, Jeep Steel Soldier, tells the story of the vehicle that helped to win the war and the incredible men and women that made it possible. That spirit of teamwork and cooperation is still evident in our people and the work they do to build on and strengthen this legacy. Jeep and UAW Region 2B are proud to support Jeep Steel Soldier. Support also provided by the Ohio Humanities Council with a We the People grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. <laughs>